This LOS is Describe Methods for Investing in Non-Domestic Equity Securities. Investing in Non-Domestic Equity Securities. So the first method we'll look at is uh, direct investing, where you're buying and selling foreign shares in a foreign market. So some of the issues with regards to direct investing in non-domestic equity securities is that it's possible that the cost will be higher and it may be less liquid. There may be less transparency and there may be a local language and currency issues as well. There may be local market procedures with regards to settlement and clearing. And finally, the accounting standards and market procedures are those of the local market and they may be different. A second method of investing in non-domestic equity securities is through depository receipts. So depository receipts are securities that trade like ordinary shares on a local exchange but which represent an economic interest in a foreign company. They allow the publicly listed shares of foreign companies to be traded on an exchange outside their domestic market. So we have two types of depository receipts. We've got sponsored depository receipts and unsponsored depository receipts. With re sponsored depository receipts, the firm is involved with the issue and the investor has the same voting and dividend rights as the foreign shareholders. Uh, there's greater firm reporting requirements and must be registered with the Securities Exchange Commission in the US. With regards to unsponsored depository receipts, the depository buys shares in the foreign market, and this is the key thing, is that the bank retains voting rights. So I put that in bold. Unsponsored depository receipts, bank retains the voting rights. Quick little practice question to check our understanding. When investing in unsponsored depository receipts, the voting rights to the shares in the trust belong to A, the depository bank, B, the investors in the depository receipts, or C, the issuer of the shares held in the trust. Well, that should be fairly easy because we just saw it on the previous slide and I put it in bold, but it shows you the reason why I put this question in, it's that uh, there can be a lot of questions that are just on little factoids, you know, and you just have to know it. If you know it, the question is really easy. If you don't, if you've overlooked it, then you're guessing. Anyhow, A is correct. In an unsponsored depository receipt, the depository bank owns the voting rights to the shares. The bank purchases the shares, places them into a trust, and then sells the shares in the trust, not the underlying shares in other markets. Investing in non-domestic equity securities. On this slide, we're going to look at global depository receipts and American depository receipts. So starting with global depository receipts, a global depository receipt is issued outside of the company's home country and outside of the United States. The depository bank that issues GDRs is generally located or has branches in the countries on whose exchanges the shares are traded. A key advantage of GDRs is that they are not subject to the foreign ownership and capital flow restrictions that may be imposed by the issuing company's home country because they are sold outside of that country. Now moving on to American depository receipts. An American depository receipt ADR is a US dollar denominated security that trades like a common share on US exchanges. First created in 1927, ADRs are the oldest type of depository receipts and are currently the most commonly traded depository receipts. They enable foreign companies to raise capital from US investors. Note that an ADR is one form of a GDR. However, not all GDRs are ADRs because GDRs cannot be publicly traded in the United States. This table is a summary of ADRs and you can see on the rows we have the objectives. Uh, raising capital on the US market, yes or no. The SEC uh, registration, the trading, listing fees, and size and earning requirements. And then on the columns we have level one which is unlisted, level two which is listed, level three which is listed, and rule 144A, which is unlisted, okay? Now, uh, this is a fair bit of nitty gritty, but there are practice questions based on some of these items in here, and that's why I've I highlighted some things in bold red and bold green, okay? So if we look at uh, level one unlisted, they uh, develop and broaden US investor base with existing shares, okay? 
you're not raising uh, capital on U.S. markets. There's a form called F6, and it's called uh, considered to be over-the-counter because it's unlisted, so it's OTC. They're not listed on exchange. It has to be over-the-counter. Listing fees are low when it's over-the-counter, and there's no uh, size and earning requirements. When we move to level two, which is listed, the objective is to develop and broaden U.S. investor base with existing shares, so it's the same objective. Are you raising capital on the U.S. markets? No. So that's also in uh, bold red. Same form, but now you are listed. So where would you be listed? New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or Amex. Therefore, when you're listed, you're going to have high listing fees. And yes, there are a uh, size and earnings requirement in order to be listed. So a lot of that's just common sense. So I think what you need to do is kind of memorize a little bit with regards to the columns level one, level two, level three. Okay. Level three listed, the objective is to develop and broaden U.S. investor base aha, with existing new shareholders. So what does new shareholders mean? It means that I can raise capital on U.S. markets, and that's why I put that in bold and green, yes, through public offerings. So there's a new form involved, it's F1, and again, I am listed, so it would be the similar exchanges, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or Amex. Again, you're listed, so high listing fees and uh, size and earnings requirements. So that's the difference between level two and level three, Level two, you're not raising new capital. Level three, you are. And finally, rule 144A, unlisted, access qualified institutional buyers, okay? That's the private placements. There's no SEC registration, and the trading is uh, private offerings, resales, or trading through an automated portal. So again, it's a private placement, so there's low listing fees, and there's no size and earning requirements. So you can see this is a type of practice question that's really getting into the nitty gritty and you could see something like this on an exam. Okay, lots to memorize with the CFA level one program. Uh, with respect to level three, sponsored ADRs, which of the following is least likely to be accurate? They A, have low listing fees, B, are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ and Amex, C, are used to raise equity capital in US markets. Okay, as I said, this question is uh, really into the nitty gritty and also it's looking for the least likely, so we're looking the false. And it's looking to level three, so it's this column that we're interested in. Okay, so our trade on New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, that's true. Uh, have low listing fees? No, that's false, okay? Because when, they, when they're listed, they're gonna have high listing fees. So A is the correct answer, they're looking at the false. Uh, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, that's true and are used to raise equity capital in the U.S. markets. That's also true. Remember, that was the difference between the level uh, three and the level two. So again, the way that I, when I see a question like this, it uh, really gets my spider sense tingling. And then I think, well, how could this be changed so it'd be similar but a little bit different? And, uh, you know, you could ask a question with regards to level two. And, uh, you know, is level two used to raise capital on U.S. markets, and that would be a no, you know, so it'd be a, a most likely or least likely. So again, you have to have some memorization of the differences between level one, level two, level three, and the rule 144A. It's not too difficult. Some of it is common sense. You just have to know, is it listed uh, uh, or not listed? And if it is listed, uh, the difference between level two and three, level three, you are uh, raising new capital, level two, you are not, okay? And this is the last slide for uh, this LOS. So we're just continuing with investing in non-domestic equity securities. And now we're looking at global res, uh, registered shares, not GDRs, not uh, depository receipts. These are global registered shares, GRS. And a global registered share, GRS, is a common share that is traded on different stock exchanges around the world in different currencies. Currency conversions are not needed to purchase or sell them because identical shares are quoted and traded in different currencies. Thus, the same purchased on the Swiss exchange in Swiss francs can be sold on the Tokyo exchange for Japanese yen. As a result, globally registered shares offer more flexibility than depository receipts because they shares represent an actual ownership interest in the company that can be traded anywhere and currency conversions are not needed to purchase or sell them. Finally, the last thing that we're going to look at is the basket of listed depository receipts. And another type of global security is a basket of listed depository receipts, uh, which is, that's an exchange traded fund, an ETF. 
and that represents a, po a portfolio of depository receipts. And that's the last slide for this LOS. Thank you.